Hello, everyone, and welcome to our question lab. We're glad you guys could join us this evening. We will be covering microbiology this evening, and we're happy you're here. Before we get started, let me introduce to you our question dissector today, Dr. Paris Vicaria. Paris. Thank you, Sean. Hi, everyone. Um, like Sean said, my name is Paris. I'm a resident physician in dermatology at UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. Um, I originally graduated from pharmacy school and then further completed medical school back home in Michigan. Um, now I'm doing my residency. Um, I've been with RX as an RX coach for a little under a year now, um, working primarily with students one-on-one -on -one, um, for USMLE Step 1, and also doing some of these dissect dissection sessions as well. Excellent, and we look forward to having uh, Dr. Vicaria lead today's session. Uh, we also have some wonderful panelists uh, with us here this evening, and they're here to answer your questions. And if you look at your go-to webinar control panel, you will see a question box, and you're welcome to ask questions there to our staff, and they'll be more than happy to try to answer as many questions as possible. And one of our panelists here today is Mark Heslin. Mark. Hi, guys. My name is Mark Heslin. I'm a third-year medical student at Cooper Medical School in Camden. Um, I've been an RX coach for about six months now, um, and I'm excited to answer all you guys' questions. Excellent. In addition to uh, Mark, we have Kate and Jeff with us, and we appreciate them being here. So like I said, if you guys have any questions, feel free to type it into the question box. Throughout today's question lab, Dr. Vicario will also be asking you certain questions that you can input your answers into that question box so we can make sure that our audience is on the right track. Speaking of audience, you guys have had a chance to meet us. Let's meet you guys. So I'm gonna ask you guys a question and I'll wait for you guys to give us an answer. So you'll see a poll pop up on your screen. The question is, what exam are you currently preparing for? So give us, a, give us a response, take a second to fill it out. Uh, this same uh, format is what you'll see for our other questions. Uh, we'll be doing four questions today, and you'll be giving us your answers and submitting them in these polls as well. So we'll give you guys a second to answer the question, and then we'll move on. Uh, while you guys answer that, my name is Sean. I've been with RX Coach for a little over a year and a half, and I uh, look forward to talking to you more about our RX Coach program here in a little bit. Excellent. Looks like you guys have answer let's see so we've got about 93 percent of you guys studying for step one and we have quite a few of you guys studying for your cbsa step two school exams and comlex and i think tonight will be beneficial for everybody in attendance and we once again appreciate all of you guys being here so that being said let me ask you guys one more question which is when are you planning to take step one so please take a minute to let us know Wonderful, looks like we're getting some responses. I'll give you guys a couple more seconds to respond so we can get to know you a little better, and then we'll begin our dissect today on microbiology. Wonderful, just so you guys know, uh, make sure you stick around to the end. We do have a raffle, and last time, a lot of our winners weren't in attendance, and remember, you have to be in attendance to win, so we'll be giving away some uh, free resources at the end, as well as a special offer for all of you guys who took the time to join us this evening. All right, looks like a lot of you guys are taking your test in October through December and also in the fall and in 2021. So uh, we look forward to uh, having you here today. And if you guys want that extra help with, uh, with your test prep to maximize your results, feel free to check out RX Coach. That is our new one-on-one -on -one tutoring program where we work with you to work on uh, bridging your knowledge gaps, finessing your test taking skills, working on timing, working on stamina, and identifying you know, your strengths and weaknesses to create a personalized study plan so we can cater to you as an individual, because as you know, every student is different, and the individual approach can really help you maximize your score. And we'll talk more about our approach later, and we will actually be employing that approach in all of our questions today. So we'll get, go ahead and get started with our first question. And like I said, we'll be using the methodology that we use in RX Coach. And the first step that we do with all of our questions and all of our students is we ask them to cover up the answer choices. And we do that because we don't want the answer choices to guide your thinking. We don't want it to dictate your thought process. And we don't want you guys to see an answer that you may be unfamiliar with, which may cause you to panic as you're reading that question and cause you to be distracted. So I've gone ahead and covered up those answers for you this evening. And so with that, we will read the lead in or the last sentence out loud. Which of the following pathogens is most likely responsible for this woman's symptoms? 
After this, we want you guys to think about, is this a one-step question, a two-step question, or a three-step question? So an example of a one-step question could be where they ask you for a diagnosis. An example of a two-step question is where they ask you, what is the treatment for a diagnosis? And an example of a three-step question is when they ask you, what is the mechanism of action of a treatment for a diagnosis? So take a second to think about how many steps this question will require you to take to come to the correct answer. And after that, we will read the stem of the question together. Now, in our coaching program, we will stop after every sentence and ask you what you're thinking. We'll ask you what's important, what you want us to highlight. So we can identify your strengths and weaknesses and follow your thought process to identify patterns. Now, today, we don't have time to do that with each of you individually. So I will pause briefly after each sentence to let you gather your thoughts. All right, let's get started. A 27-year-old woman comes to her primary care physician because she has been feeling under the weather for the past two weeks. Her history is remarkable only for previously diagnosed mitral valve prolapse. On examination, her temperature is 38.5 or 101.3 Fahrenheit. The patient has small erythematous papules on her palms, and painful raised lesions on her finger pads. The results of an ophthalmologic examination are shown in the image. And I'll give you guys a second to take a look at that image. Which of the following pathogens is most likely responsible for this woman's symptoms? Dr. Vicaria. Thank you, Sean. So we're going to go ahead and read those answer choices out loud. And we recommend reading the answer choices and starting from the bottom and working your way up. So in this case, starting with answer choice E and then working your way up to A. The reason we do that is because we don't want you to get distracted or missed an answer choice that you come across early on and then select that without going through all the answer choices. So this ensures that you don't bias yourself and you get to read all those answer choices. So we'll go ahead and do that here. Answer choice E, Streptococcus sanguinis, D, Streptococcus pyogenes, C, Streptococcus agalactiae, B, Staphylococcus aureus, and A, Haemophilus influenzae. So we'll give everyone a couple seconds to gather your thoughts. Um, Sean's gonna go ahead and open up that poll. Please, please select the answer choice that you think is correct, and we will talk about it in just a couple seconds. Excellent. So we'll give you guys a couple seconds to hear to respond. And remember, if you guys aren't sure what the answer is, just like on the test, you should never leave a question banks. So feel free to just select the answer that you know you uh, you think is correct, or just take a guess if you're unsure. And if you get it wrong, don't worry. This is a learning process. Our goal is to teach you things today and teach you techniques so that you don't make these mistakes on test day and get it right when you see these concepts on the big day. So it looks like a lot of you guys have answered. Let's see how you guys did. So it looks like 35% of you guys picked strep pyogenes and 29% of you guys picked staph aureus. So let's see what the correct answer is. The correct answer is E, strep sanguinis. And with that, I will turn it back over to Dr. Vicaria. Once again, if you guys got it wrong, don't worry. We're here to learn. We're gonna get it right on test day. Dr. Vicaria. Thank you, Sean. So this is a patient who presented with a fever and small erythematous papules on her palms and lesions on her finger pads. She also has a history of mitral valve prolapse. And then that eye exam is showing these white spots on her retina surrounded by hemorrhage, as Sean is circling there. Together, these suggest a diagnosis of endocarditis, likely bacterial endocarditis, which is characterized by numerous signs and symptoms of microemboli. Now, if we can go back to that table, um, Sean has kind of pulled up here um, a lot of those names for those microemboli um, that they had talked about in this patient. So Osler's nodes, which are tender raised lesions on the finger pads, Roth spots, which are those round white spots on the retina that are surrounded by hemorrhage, 
that's what we saw in the image. And Janeway lesions, which are small, non-tender erythematous lesions on the palms or sole. Um, also, splinter hemorrhages as well, you can see those in the nail bed. So these are a lot of those signs of microemboli. Now the question is, is this more subacute or is this more acute bacterial endocarditis? Because the pathogen is different. In acute endocarditis, it's usually Staphylococcus aureus, and that's because that's highly virulent. However, in this case, they told us that this patient was kind of feeling under the weather for the past two weeks. So a little bit more of a gradual onset is listed there. On top of that, this patient also has an abnormal or diseased valve with mitral valve prolapse. So more than likely, this is subacute bacterial endocarditis. The most common cause is viridan streptococca. Can you guys name what are some um, different types of viridan streptococci species? Um, on the right side of your screen, you should, should see a question box. If you wanna go ahead and open up that question box, and post in there, what are some different Streptococcus species that you think fall under the Viridans category? And we'll give everyone a couple seconds to do that. Excellent. So we'll give us a couple seconds to respond and give us your, uh, your thoughts here. I see some really good ones coming in. Strep mutans uh, is one that we're seeing a lot. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Dr. Vicario. Thank you, Sean. Yes, absolutely. Streptococcus mutans. Sanguinous, as was the correct answer here, uh, anginosis and mitis are all different streptococcus species that are fall under the category of viridan streptococca. So in this case, this is likely to be the correct answer because we've determined that this is more subacute on a diseased or damaged valve than acute bacterial endocarditis. So let's go over the other answer choices and why those are incorrect. Answer choice D, streptococcus pyogenes. This is actually a group A streptococcus, not a viridan strep, and this is a causative agent in streptococcal pharyngitis. Um, they don't tell us anything about uh, uh, cervical lymphadenopathy, um, an erythematous pharynx or exudate or sandpaper-like rash. Um, those are all characteristic signs and symptoms of group A uh, streptococcus py pyogenes pharyngitis, which we're not seeing here, so likely an incorrect answer. Group B strep, answer choice C, Streptococcus agalactiae. That's best known for causing a life-threatening illness in newborns, such as meningitis. Um, although this patient does have a fever, there's no other signs here that this patient may have meningitis. Um, so this is likely an incorrect answer as well. Answer choice B, Staphylococcus aureus. This is a gram-positive cocci. Um, and is the most common pathogen for acute bacterial endocarditis. Um, probably the main other answer choice to, to consider here, um, but that is more of a rapidly progressive illness with a very high fever, shaking chills. Um, this case is a little bit more gradual. She said she's kind of feeling under the weather for the past two weeks. Um, and on top of that, Staph aureus is a little bit more virulent and would cause larger vegetations on normal valves. Um, and it's also something to consider in IV drug users as well, um, not what is going on in this question. Lastly, Haemophilus influenzae. Um, this is a small gram-negative rod, um, causes a variety of uh, infectious conditions such as epiglottitis, meningitis, otitis media. Um, Haemophilus is um, part of the HASEC organisms that are isolated in some cases of subacute endocarditis. However, the most common cause is viridan streptococci, um, which is why answer choice E is the correct answer. Um, so the takeaway from this question is that um, endocarditis, like most infectious diseases, is a very high yield um, thing to know for step one. Um, it's important to know the clinical manifestations um, cutaneous signs that can clue you in, and then also know the various pathogens that can cause that disease and how to differentiate them. Excellent. Well, you know, we, uh, we this was a challenging question. About 28% of you guys got it right. So it was, it was a challenging question, but like I said, our goal is to learn, 
to learn how to identify these clues to get to the correct answer in a method uh, in a methodology that's consistent with every single question to help us minimize the variables of making mistakes uh, due to test taking skills. So with that, uh, we will move on now to our second question of the evening. Once again, for those of you just joining us, the first step that we use uh, here in Rx Coach, our new tutoring program, is to cover up the answer choices. And the reason we do that is to make sure that you guys aren't distracted by the answer choices, to make sure that the answer choices do not guide your thinking, and to ensure that you guys don't see an answer choice that you may be unfamiliar with, which then may cause you to panic or stress out as you read the question. As you can see here, I've went ahead and covered up the answer choices for you. And after that, we will read the lead-in together. Biopsy of the liver would yield which of the following findings? And I want you guys to think about whether this is a one-step question, a two-step question, or a three-step question. I'll give you guys a second to do that. All right. And with that, we will now read the stem of the question together. A 36-year-old man comes to the physician complaining of an aching back, high fever, and vomiting of dark material for the past week. The patient reports that he recently returned from an African safari in Western Kenya and confirms that he was bitten by numerous mosquitoes. Physical examination reveals a febrile male in distress. He denies recent alcohol use. The patient's temperature is 39 degrees Celsius or 102.2 Fahrenheit, and he has a yellow tinge to the white of his eyes. Biopsy of the liver would yield which of the following findings? Dr. Vicaria. Thank you, Sean. So once again, we'll start at the bottom and work our way up with the answer choices. E, wavable Pilati bodies. D, Negri bodies, C, Mallory bodies, B, Dole bodies, and A, Councilman bodies. So we'll give everyone a couple seconds to gather your thoughts. Sean's going to go ahead and open up that poll. Please go ahead and select the answer choice that you think is correct, and we will talk about it in just a couple seconds. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Vicaria. So once again, uh, as we mentioned earlier, there are no uh, penalties for guessing on the exam if you don't know what the answer choice is. So if you don't know what the answer is here, feel free to take your best guess and we'll go over the correct and incorrect answers together just like we did for question one once you guys have submitted your responses. So we'll give you guys a couple more seconds to input your responses. I see a lot of them coming in. Look, one of them is a heavy favorite so far. And let's see how we do. Give you guys a couple more seconds and then we'll go ahead and get started. So. It looks like about two thirds of you guys have responded. So let's take a look and see what the audience came up with. It looks like 41% of you picked A, councilman bodies, and in second place was Mallory bodies. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. Correct answer is A, councilman bodies, and 41% of you guys got that right. So good job. Once again, another challenging question. And now let's talk about why that's the correct answer and why the other answers are incorrect. Dr. Vicaria. Thank you, John. So this is indicating um, that this patient recently took a trip to Africa. And now this patient is reporting an aching back, high fever, and black vomitus. Very high yield things to know. He also reports numerous mosquito bites and a yellow tinged slurry which is indicating that he has jaundice. So this is indicating that this patient has an infection with yellow fever. Um, and if we go to that table, um, as Sean is pulling up, you can see that the symptoms there include high fever, black vomitus, and jaundice, which is, which is what they were getting at with that scleral icterus. The most common vectors are the Aedes mosquitoes. Okay, diagnosis is usually via serology or PCR. Um, now, if the liver biopsy is done, you can see councilman bodies, which are, as it says there, um, eosinophilic globules thought to be um, the hepatocytes undergoing apoptosis. So this patient has nice classic presentation of yellow fever. 
let's talk about the other answer choices and why those are incorrect. Answer choice E, label pull antibodies. Now these are normally seen in vascular endothelial cells. They store and release von Willebrand's factor and P-selectin. They're normal components of vascular endothelium, not the liver. So that is an incorrect answer choice. D, Negri bodies. Can you all name what that is pathognomonic for? Go ahead and open up that question box again, post what you think Negri bodies are pathognomonic for, and we'll talk about it in just a second. Excellent. So we're seeing here a lot of people saying rabies. Dr. Vicaris. Yes. Yep. Thank you, Sean. Absolutely. Those are pathognomonic for the rabies virus. They are eosinophilic inclusions found in the nerve cells of infected individuals. Um, this patient did not report any animal bites, just mosquito bites, and also doesn't have any neurologic issues. So this is likely an incorrect answer. Answer choice C, Mallory bodies. Um, these are most commonly found in a couple things, alcoholic hepatitis and alcoholic cirrhosis, uh, but they can occur in a few other things as well. So these are e also eosinophilic inclusions in the cytoplasm of um, swollen hepatocytes. Now this patient does have jaundice, as we mentioned, where you may think this is a correct answer. But remember, this question is focusing on his recent travel to Africa and the mosquito bites. Um, also, let's keep in mind, the STEM told us that this patient is, has a lack of heavy recent drinking, suggesting that his symptoms are not caused by alcoholic hepatitis, um, making this an unlikely finding as well. And lastly, answer choice B, dull bodies. These are oval bodies found in the neutrophils of patients with infections, trauma, pregnancy, a variety of things nonspecific to the yellow virus um, infection that is going on in this case so also incorrect. So the takeaway point from this question is it's important to know um, with these infectious diseases, some important epidemiology. So where are they traveling to? What are some high yield signs and symptoms such as black vomitus that's important to remember? On top of that, it can be a numerous step question like Sean had alluded to. In this case, it's you had to know the infection and then you needed to know uh, that you could show um, questions could even take it a step further and just show you images of these answer choices, um, making it a little bit more difficult. So make sure you keep all of those um, on the back of your mind as you're reviewing your material. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Vicaria. So that is our second question. And before we move on to the third question, I want to tell you a little bit about Rx coach. So as we mentioned before, Dr. Vicaria and Mark Hesslin, our panelists, they're both Rx coaches. And what they do is they work with students one on one. We start with the 160 question assessment to really gauge your strengths and weaknesses. And then we use that to come up with a personalized study plan. As you know, everybody in your class, every student that you'll encounter is different. You have different strengths and weaknesses, different learning styles, different ways of thinking, different ways of applying what you've learned. So with this one-on-one -on -one approach, we're able to focus on you to help you maximize your potential by focusing on the areas which you need to focus on. And this allows you to maximize not only your score, but also become more efficient when you're studying. We have so many students that study really hard, but they don't see the gains and the progress that they would like to see. And so we like to step in and help students achieve their target scores in a more uh, strategic way to save them time and get them that score so they can get that dream residency, which they've been dreaming about. All of our certified tutors, uh, all of our tutors are certified, they're RX certified. Uh, that means they go through a very selective hiring process and training process, and all of our packages for Rx Coach include access to Rx360 and Rx Bricks. Now, as you can see here, we have a testimonial from one of our students. With regards to my experience so far, it has been excellent. My coach is great at explaining concepts that I find complicated, and he does an incredible job guiding each session in a way that fills all of the gaps in my knowledge for step one. Overall, I am very glad to be a part of Rx Coach, and we have a lot of success stories with our students. And if you want to be one of those success stories, please visit rx-coach.com to schedule a free consultation to learn more about our coaching program. 
If you want some general advice or a free study schedule, please visit us at firstaidteam.com. That being said, make sure you stick around to the end because we do have a raffle and a very special offer for all of you guys in attendance. All right, let's move on now to question three. Once again, you'll see the answer choices are covered up and we will begin by reading the last sentence or the lead in. Which of the following viruses is most similar in genetic makeup to the virus causing this patient's current infection? I want you guys to take a second to think about how many steps this question will require. I'll give you guys a little bit to think. All right, and now we will read the stem of the question together. A worried mother brings her three-year-old son to the pediatric clinic. She reports that he has vomited twice since yesterday. The vomitus was non-bloody and non-bilious. She also reports having seen copious amounts of stool in the toilet. She states that there has been a recent outbreak of diarrhea among the children at her son's daycare. The patient is up to date on all vaccinations. His temperature is 37.8 Celsius or 100 Fahrenheit. Pulse is 123 per minute and respirations are 14 a minute. And blood pressure is 100 over 72. On physical examination, the patient appears quiet and tired. His eyes are sunken and oral mucosa is dry. Auscultation of the abdomen reveals hyperactive bowel sounds. Which of the following viruses is most similar in genetic makeup to the virus causing this patient's current infection? Dr. Vicario. Thank you, Sean. So once again, we will go ahead and start at the bottom and work our way up. Answer choice E, rubella. D, poliovirus. C, parvovirus. B, para influenza, and A, influenza. So we'll give everyone a couple seconds to gather your thoughts. Sean's gonna go ahead and open up that poll, and then we will let you all, or please, you know, please go ahead and select an answer choice, and then we will uh, talk about it in just a couple seconds. Excellent, so right. once again, uh, we'll wait for you guys to submit your responses, and as always, if you're unsure of what the answer is, take your best guess and we will spend some time going over the correct and incorrect answers afterwards. And if you like our question approach and you want to be a part of our Rx Coach program, please visit us at rx-coach.com. We do these question labs every Tuesday evening at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Next week, we will be covering reproductive. So make sure you tune in next week for reproductive. We'll give you guys a couple more seconds before Dr. Vicaria explains to you all of these answer choices. Excellent, looks like we have a lot of responses. Let's take a look and see what you guys chose. Looks like 32% of you guys chose answer choice C, parvovirus. And in second place with 30% of you guys selecting D was poliovirus. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is D, poliovirus. And 30% of you guys got that question right. Like I said, if you didn't get it right, don't worry. We're here to learn and we're going to get it right on test day. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Vicaria. Thank you, Sean. So this child is presenting with vomiting, diarrhea, and they also told us that on physical exam, his eyes are sunken and his oral mucosa is dry. Those are signs of dehydration. And importantly, he has a history of exposure to a recent outbreak of diarrhea at the daycare. So these signs and symptoms of gastroenteritis are most suggestive of an infection. And then the question becomes, is this an infection with norovirus or rotavirus? It's one of the age old questions. Now, due to vaccination efforts against rotavirus, Norovirus is now the most common cause of, of viral gastroenteritis in children in research-rich countries. Um, so in this case, the answer choice is norovirus. 
No, the question is asking us, which of the following viruses is most similar in genetic makeup to that virus, to norovirus? So can you guys name some genetic features, some of the, the makeup of norovirus? Go ahead and open up that question box. Post in there some things you can tell me about norovirus. Is it a DNA virus, an RNA virus, single-stranded, double-stranded, things like that. And then we'll talk about it in just a second. Looks like we have some people saying RNA, linear, double-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA, double-stranded DNA. So we've got a whole host of answers here with uh, more people leaning towards positive sense RNA, it seems. So Dr. Vicaria. Yeah, thank you, Sean. So norovirus is a positive sense, single-stranded RNA that is non-segmented with a non-enveloped icosahedral capsid. Now I know that's a lot, so let me repeat that. Positive sense, single-stranded RNA virus, non-segmented with a non-enveloped icosahedral capsid. So now the question is asking us which of the following viruses is most similar to that makeup? And in, of the answer choices, that would be poliovirus. Um, poliovirus also, as you can see Sean circling there, um, also has a lot of those same features and is the correct answer in this question. So now let's talk about why the other answer choices are incorrect. Answer choice E, rubella. Now rubella is part of the toga viruses and these also have icosahedral nucleocapsids. They are enveloped um, with single-stranded non-segmented RNA. Now we just said that norovirus is not enveloped and we just said that rubella is enveloped. So in that case, answer choice E or rubella is likely incorrect. We talked about how D is the correct answer, so we'll move on to C, parvovirus, which was another highly selected answer choice. Parvovirus is a single-stranded DNA virus. So this is a DNA virus, while norovirus is an RNA virus. So that also excludes this answer choice um, and makes this incorrect. Answer choice B, parainfluenza. This is part of the paramyxoviruses. Um, these commonly affect pediatric population. Um, they have helical nucleocapsids. They possess single-stranded negative sense RNA. So the virus affecting this child in this question has an icosahedral capsid, not a helical nucleocapsid, um, and is also not enveloped um, and is um, positive sense as well, while parainfluenza is negative sense. So this is also likely to be incorrect. And lastly, influenza. Uh, the influenza virus is part of the orthomyxoviruses. Um, they also, like parainfluenza, have helical nucleocapsids. And these are also enveloped, unlike norovirus. Um, and these are also negative sense RNA viruses, while the norovirus is a positive sense RNA virus. Thus, this is also different. Um, from norovirus, and poliovirus is most like norovirus of the answer choices, so that is the correct answer in this question. Um, the main takeaway from this question, obviously, is that there's a lot of different ways that the, um, the USMLE Step 1 can ask you about viruses. A lot of those little factoids about single sense, sorry, single strand, negative sense, positive sense, um, it's important to know those because this is a perfect example um, of how they can ask you a question and it kind of re requires you to know that information. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Vicaria. So uh, once again, another challenging question, about 30% of you guys got it right. And I hope the uh, uh, I hope that 100% of you guys uh, learned from this question and that you guys will learn from the next question as well, which will be our last question of the evening. And remember, we're doing a raffle at the end of the uh, question lab tonight. Uh, and two lucky winners will get some amazing prizes and you must be present to win. So make sure you stick around uh, for the raffle that will be conducted by Mr. Jeffrey Downing. With that, let's move on to our last question of the evening. And once again, if you guys are liking this approach, you're finding it helpful, keep in mind that we're doing this again next week, Tuesday, 6 p.m. Eastern time. And that topic will be on reproductive.
once again, you guys will see that the answer choices are, are, are covered up, and we will uh, begin by reading the leading uh, sentence or the last sentence together. What is the mechanism of action of the drug of choice for treating this infection? I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to think about how many steps this question will require you to take, and then we'll read the stem together. All right. And now let's read the stem. A 60-year-old man presents to the clinic because he has been feeling unwell for the past week. His symptoms include difficulty falling asleep, a productive cough, and drenching night sweats. Past medical history is significant for severe persistent asthma, which is poorly controlled on high-dose oral glucocorticoids. A chart review reveals a 10-pound weight loss since his first, sorry, since his last office visit three months ago. Vital signs are temperature of 100.8 Fahrenheit, blood pressure of 98 over 62, pulse of 90, respiratory rate of 22, and saturation of 90% on two liters of oxygen. A CT scan of the chest is obtained and shows abscesses in the lungs. A purified protein derivative, PPD, skin test is negative. An acid fast stain of the patient's sputum is revealing. And I'll give you guys a second to take a look at that image. And now we will read the lead in or that last sentence again which is what is the mechanism of action of the drug of choice for treating this infection? Dr. Vicario. Thank you, Sean. So once again, we'll go ahead and read those answer choices from the bottom and work our way up. Answer choice E, inhibits peptidoglycan cross-linking to block bacterial cell wall synthesis. D, inhibits formation of the initiation complex by binding to the 30S ribosomal subunit and causing misreading of mRNA. C, inhibition of dihydropterate synthase. B, decreases synthesis of mycolic acids. And A, binds ergosterol and forms membrane pores. So once again, we'll give everyone a couple seconds, gather your thoughts. Sean's gonna go ahead and open up that poll. Please select the answer choice you think is correct, and we will talk about it in just a couple seconds. And I'm going to read to you answer choice E and D because they're a little long and they wouldn't fit in our poll here. So answer choice E is inhibits peptidoglycan cross-linking to block bacterial cell wall synthesis. And answer choice D is inhibits formation of the initiation complex by binding to the 30S ribosomal, uh, uh, ribosomal subunit and causing misreading of mRNA. So I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to submit your responses. And then we will go over the answers and get to our raffle. I will take this uh, moment to tell you guys about some of our success stories. We've recently had students score over 260 after using Rx Coach. One of our students just took his test today uh, and sent a very nice thank you note to his tutor. So we've had a lot of students do really well with our program and we hope that uh, you will succeed on your exam with or without us. If you want us to be a part of your journey, please visit rx-coach.com for more information and to schedule a free consultation to discuss the program and how it can benefit you. And of course, we'll get to work with one of our wonderful coaches like Dr. Vicaria or Mark Hessling. I see that only a quarter of you guys have answered, so uh, I'll give you guys some more time. Keep in mind that, you know, this is a challenging question. There are multiple steps involved here, but if you don't know what the answer is, take your best guess and we're gonna review everything together here in a moment. So it looks like only about a quarter of you have answered so far. So we'll give you guys a little bit more time to come to that answer choice. All right, well, we will give you guys a couple more seconds. Like I said, if you guys don't know what the answer is, feel free to just take your best guess. I see less than a third of you have answered so far. I know it's challenging, but Hopefully, we'll get to the correct answer, or at least pick one if you are unsure of what it is. I'll give you guys a couple more seconds to respond. I want to see at least uh, uh, at least half of you guys respond, if possible. 
It looks like the audience is giving up on me here. Well, like I said, there's no penalties for guessing uh, and for selecting the wrong answer on testy or now. So just feel free to take your best guess and let's go over the answer choices together and learn together. Sean, this is Jeff. I think we're hearing from uh, some of the uh, participants that uh, the poll isn't working or it's uh, it's locked for some users. So, well, let's do this. If it's not working for you, why don't you submit your answers in the question box? Okay, so let's submit answers in the question box. We'll give you guys a couple of seconds to do that. Uh, the poll is up and live, but unfortunately, we have a little bit of a technical issue, it seems. So, feel free to submit your answer here in the question box instead. All right. Well, it looks like based on the responses we got that 24% of you guys selected answer choice D, which is inhibits initiation complex by binding to the 30S ribosomal unit, causing misreading of mRNA. And it was tied with answer choice B, which is decreases synthesis of mycolic acid. So let's see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is C, inhibition of dihydropterate synthase. And 22% of you guys selected uh, answer choice C, and that is the correct answer. So well done. Uh, once again, it was a challenging question. I know we had some issues with the poll, but uh, let's learn uh, together with uh, Dr. Vicaria. Dr. Vicaria. Thank you, Sean. So this patient they reported has difficulty sleeping, a productive cough, drenching night sweats, which is never a good thing, as well as recent weight loss. Now, they also told us that this patient is on high dose oral steroids or oral glucocorticoids. That means he is in a state of immunosuppression. So thus, they are likely getting at some sort of infection. And in this case, in this question, there is a suspicion for nocardia asteroides infection. Nocardia infections are known to present in patients who are immunocompromised, such as this patient who is on high dose chronic steroids. Nocardia is a gram positive weakly acid fast bacteria. Um, if we can go to that table, um, Sean has nicely pulled up an image that kind of goes over nocardia versus actinomyces. Nocardia is gram positive, it is weakly acid fast and it forms long branching filaments. Now these findings on CT, they told us show abscesses in the lungs and that also is consistent with nocardia. Because of its acid fast nature and its similar disease process, um, pulmonary nocardiosis is frequently mistaken for TB or tuberculosis. So let's, we'll talk about that in just a second as well. Now for nocardia infections, sulfonamides are the drug of choice, and these work by inhibiting dihydropterate synthase. So another extra step question um, that uh, the question is asking you about. And Sean is highlighting a nice mnemonic there to help remember um, which drug treats nocardia versus which drug treats actinomyces. Now keep in mind actinomyces, as we see there, is not acid fast. So that will be helpful. Um, as we go through those other incorrect answer choices. So let's go through those really quickly as well. Answer choice E inhibits peptidoglycan crosslinking to block bacterial cell wall synthesis. This is referring to penicillin, and it is used for, um, for example, actinomyces. Now, the causative organism, as you can see there from the sputum sample, shows a branching pattern and that could resemble actinomyces, which is treated with penicillin. However, actinomyces most commonly causes oral and facial abscesses, not lung abscesses. And on top of that, it is not acid fast, it is not stained with acid fast, while nocardia does. And as you can see there, there is a positive, a weakly positive stain. So answer choice E, penicillin, is incorrect. Answer choice D inhibits formation of the initiation complex by binding to that 30S ribosomal subunit and causing mRNA misreading. This is referring to aminoglycosides. 
They are used primarily in the, uh, for the treatment of gram-negative rod infections. And what we see here is we see a weakly acid fast organism that argues for nocardia and not a gram-negative rod infection. So answer choice D is also incorrect. We talked about how C is a correct answer, so let's move on to B. Decreases synthesis of mycolic acids. This is referring to isoniazid. Now this is used both to treat and to provide prophylaxis against TB or mycobacterium tuberculosis. Now this, the causative organism in this case, or nocardia, is often confused initially with TB because they have similar signs and symptoms. Productive cough, drenching night sweats, weight loss, things like that. However, in that question stem, they told us that the PPD skin test is negative. So that should rule, help rule out um, answer choice B or TB um, specifically. And lastly, answer choice A, binds ergosterol and forms membrane pores. This is referring to amphotericin B, uh, which is an antifungal agent. Now, fungal pneumonia can present with similar signs and symptoms as well, such as cough, night sweats, um, decreased oxygen saturation like this patient had. But again, based on that sputum staining, amphotericin would not be effective because the sputum staining is telling us it's not a fungal infection. So answer choice A would also be incorrect. So the takeaway from this question is it's important to know the different staining characteristics of the different microbes, as well as know which agents um, are used to treat which microbes. And then again, they can take it a step further by asking you about the mechanism of action of those agents like they did in this question. Excellent, thank you so much, Dr. Vicaria. Well, it looks like we've done our questions. One thing I do want to show you guys is our Rx Bricks resource. For those of you who want to learn more about nocardia or actinomyces, feel free to take a look at Rx Bricks. We do have some free bricks available, including a new COVID brick. Okay, so all of our bricks start off with learning objectives, which will map out what you should be learning as you review this brick. Once you look at the learning objectives, you will see the content review, which will include, you know, in this case, some, some images uh, of nocardian actinomyces, so you can see them on histo. You will also see some practice questions and clinical correlations, and at the end of the break, you will be able to go deeper to learn more about those topics covered. And if you have access to Rx360, you can directly go into that topic in Flash Facts, Express Videos, or QMAX, and it even tells you how many cards we have, how long it will take you, how many videos we have, and how many questions we have relating to this topic. And we've done one of those today. It also tells you exactly where you can find this information in First Aid 2020, and that's page 139. So once again, take a look at Rx Bricks. It's a wonderful new resource, and it really helps put things together, organize this information, and then allow you to go deeper to learn more.